Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and you are very welcome to the Mindful Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Cooper. I'm a sales strategist, sales coach. I help deliver better results. This series is all about insightful leadership. People that actually do something slightly different, very gifted, uh, that employ exceptional results and unusual strategies to great effect. So today I'm speaking to a wonderful Michael Bunting, and he's across the pond, the other side of the world. So he's about uh, 10, 12 hours ahead of me in the future. How is the future, Michael? Yeah, it's been pretty rainy today. So we're probably like in Ireland. I'm in Australia and it's normally sunny, but today has been very rainy. But it's good. It's all good. Yeah. It's great here as well. Awesome. That's always raining here. So, uh, as you know, <laughs> I know I lived here for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. You said that actually. Uh, you, you suggested that you lived in a place called Fox Rock. So, for people that are living outside of Ireland, uh, Fox Rock is uh, quite an affluent area. So, it's a, a, it's a wonderful green area to live in. So, a little bit of blurb about Michael. I'm turning my head because uh, I want to say Michael is an author of uh, a couple of best selling books. One is the mindful leader, which is awesome because it's very relevant to this podcast. The most specific person that's been on this podcast, which is the same name, which is absolutely phenomenal. The mindful leader, practical guide to mindful meditation and uh, extraordinary leadership in Australia, New Zealand. I lived in New Zealand for a year, so it's a beautiful place. And uh, he founder of Awakened Mind, a premium mindfulness uh, app which is, I'd like to discuss as well, because I, I use a mindfulness app as well. So I'd like to work, understand how you use that. Uh, you work uh, all around the globe, uh, you're a keynote speaker, and you have four children as well in Sydney, Australia. That is awesome. But thank you very much for coming on board today and speaking with me. Great to be here, Jason. I'm just chuckling at all of the statistics you've read there. Yeah, I know. Uh, some of them are made up. and I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, it was given to me. Uh, it's just that I, I yeah. come on board with that. So, yeah, thank you so much uh, uh, with that. So just describe to me what you do, Michael. It's uh, really interesting to have a mindful leader as uh, your company name so that I'm really yeah. intrigued. Yeah. So my, my primary work at is I do a range of things, but the big, big, big piece is, is culture change. So whether that be in a team or a whole organization, whether that be a local or a global organization, and and, and I'll give you a classic example. So an organization might come to us, the CEO might come to us and say, you know, we, we, need, we, we need to upgrade our culture or we need to change our culture or we need to improve our culture. We're losing people. We don't have enough engagement. We're not attracting the best people. Uh, where our culture is inefficient, whatever it might be. And at that point, I usually ask them, so, so tell me, describe two behaviors in your culture that really don't work for you and describe two behaviors you'd love to replace them with, like really simple at that. And usually, interestingly enough, they struggle. They usually mm -hmm. don't come down to that question. And the tell them to go away. And once they've defined uh, their new behaviors they want to integrate into their culture and what they need to drop away, we typically then design these big, long programs for them with a whole range of adult, adult development and behavioral science principles to help them go from A to B. So to help, and that also applies to you know people in, in a personal level. So if I had to give you an example of what we do organizationally at a personal level, if someone came to us and said, my marriage sucks, and I'd really like to improve my marriage. Mm -hmm. We would ask the same question. So t tell me two behaviors that, that are prevalent in your marriage that are really painful for you and you don't want those behaviors. And what would you like to see them as? Mm -hmm. And then they would define that for us. And then we begin. Okay, great. So we want to go from this to that. Excellent. And then there's a whole range of things that have to happen. For example, and I'll use an easy example of a marriage. You know, the first thing we've got to get the person out of his blame mindset. So mm -hmm. the first thing I'll be thinking is if they're, let's say they're a male and they're married to a female and they'll say, well, my, my, my wife, uh, you know, she needs to change these X and Y things. Our first thing would be, well, hold on a second. You can't change her. Let's just look at what you're doing first mm -hmm. and get you to take full ownership of what you're doing first. And the same applies with culture change where leaders typically think everyone else should change to make things better, but not them. And we usually turn the mirror back in on them to look at how they need to shift because they're actually determining the culture. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, when people are in the blame mindset with each other, nothing ever changes, ever. It's nice. the same as parenting. It's the same as anything until you can take accountability and ownership. But then that's scary for people because they don't know how to take accountability without blaming and beating themselves up. So you need to practice compassion and awareness. People yeah. don't know how to regulate their behavior. So we teach them this whole bunch of self-awareness stuff. They don't know how to create change, sticky change over time. So we do all of that. And, um, you know, as I said, our, our programs can scale from, you know, an executive team of a medium-sized organization who wants to shift right through to, we, we've done some work at a global level with some of the biggest companies in the world where we've worked with the CEO and the executive team and, and scaled it down uh, through, through right through, mostly senior leadership because they are the ones that have the biggest impact, but the intention is to impact everyone. So how do you know... Or how do you know a company has a problem? They usually tell us. Ah, and it's really it's really interesting because things are evolving now. Where um, you know, I think in organisations, and I sometimes one can be cynical that in in business it's all about money, and you're like all the stuff on health and well being and culture. It's really nice, but at the end of the day, it's about making money. But as the data and the evidence and the research has evolved, organisations are really now understanding that your culture is costing you money or making you money at some yeah. level. And so some of our clients, like our, one of our big clients, uh, discovered that the stock market declared that their culture was inefficient. Mm -hmm. It's like your culture is like, it's it, 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 the profit per employee is just too low. Even though you make a lot of money, you're a fat cat, that's not making enough, if you're not, make, you're not efficient. And they identify as our culture. And yeah. it's like, well, how on earth do you work that out? Like, if our culture is inefficient, how do we, and so we ask those basic questions again. So what are the behaviors that you're seeing on a daily basis that are creating inefficiency? And as an example, in their example, they said, well, it seems that people are always trying to impress. And, they, and that results in things like slide decks overdone. People yeah. being in meetings that they shouldn't be in because they mm -hmm. want to be seen in that meeting. Uh, everybody wanting a say in every, in every new product because everyone wants to have their name on it. And all this image management, and that's, profoundly uh, inefficient and expensive for the business. So how do we shift that image management into more like growth and learning? And that's what we do. We take them through that journey. So I, I was thinking while you were talking is uh, ego. Yeah. So what are, what are the, the, the key traits of uh, corporate ego? What, what, how can you distill that down to sort of get that ego and just get that G-O to make it go so the first thing you'll find us with our work is we're really very careful with what we how we define things we're very committed to simplicity but we're very very committed to accuracy around definitions because they matter and one of those is ego interesting enough so we've come to the view over the years and years and years of, of deeper development work we've done to notice that often when we're naming when we are saying the words ego or someone else's ego we ourselves are in, in a state of anger and a state of judgment. And guess what that is? That's the ego. So when we're calling someone else on the ego, we are in the ego. So mm -hmm. we've tended to come to a view that ego is really a set of coping mechanisms. And the more destructive forms of those coping mechanisms are usually based on very painful wounds. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, the average person who's behaving badly or dysfunctionally, that behavior is coming from internal pain and internal yep. ignorance from them. So the most appropriate response, you need boundaries, is compassion. And that's where the whole concept of mindful leadership comes in. But what we see in organization, and I say this with, it's taken me years and years and years to learn compassion around this, because I would be the first one to judge normally and still have those traits. But I'd say that, you know, if you're compassionate with people, getting a promotion matters. It, it matters yeah. for the pace they pay off their mortgage, that where the school, can, children can go to school, it matters. And you play the game, right? And if you play the game in corporations, it's usually a looking good game. So you've got to impress. You've got to be seen. If you're quiet, the person who's louder might get promoted because you were quiet because you were unassuming. So you yeah. learn there's a certain game you have to play, and it's a very, very egocentric game, unfortunately. But just underneath that game is a lot of fear. There's tremendous amount of fear, fear for job, fear for needing to, there's all kinds of fear. So we would see the ego process as a general rule is, is it's fear in action. Mm -hmm. And so stripping the ego, quote unquote, ego away is takes a lot of courage because it's about facing fear inside ourselves. But it's, it's mostly around narcissism. 
in corporates, right? When you get to senior leaders, it's all about me, 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 and my bonus. And again, it's easy to judge that. But if we were in that position, we probably are thinking the same ourselves most of the time, which then yeah. creates disconnection. It's uh, probably a little bit to do with the way our bodies are built as well, the fight, flight, or freeze. So depending on the type of character you are, you probably are either going to fight and get that ego up in front of you based on how uh, our brains are working, or you're going to flee and you're just going to be hidden under the scenes. And then you're, yeah. the, you're the ones that are going to be complaining about how the leaders are actually treating you. So how do you deal with that? Because that's a conflict in well, itself. Yeah, we have, a, we have a distinct process in our work where we get people to name the behaviors in the organization that are really ticking them off and upsetting them. So they're usually in a big list like this. Mm -hmm. And then we switch into, with a quite, we've tried and tested a way where we get them to take ownership for the same behaviors they do. So we're trying mm -hmm. to get rid of the hypocrisy really quickly because there's no such thing as organizational change. There's mm -hmm. only individual change done at scale. There's no, the organization will change. There's human beings who will change themselves. And as long as there's a blame mindset, nothing will change. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, people are in less power around a leader. So the leader obviously sets the tone. So if you want scale change in an organization, you cannot get it without senior leaders doing the work. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. But you can still do your own change and development work uh, it, with the exception, of, even if the leaders are not. The key, this is important, is why are you doing change? And the one of the big mistakes we see corporations do is they kind of voice change on people, changing our culture. And here's what it's going to be like, you know, and that's what we need to do. To, you need to be more growth mindset to, yeah. to learn faster than the competition. People don't change really for the sake of some organization they work for. They need to have a sense of a personal why. And we do a lot of work on that. We need to, you know, why would you want growth mindset anyway? Well, what's the alternative? The alternative is a frozen stuck mindset. Do you want to be the same where you, you don't know, grow in 10 years? Well, then the same problems you have today will be the same problems you have in 10 years. You'll yeah. be repeating patterns. How about growing for your own well-being and happiness? We put people a lot of data in front of people to help them see that the change in growth is actually a really, really beneficial to you personally. One of the other useful things that's worth noting and as for your listeners is that we ask the really stupid, dumb questions usually in our work to establish a baseline. Like the first thing is, you know, we're talking about leadership, for example. Yeah. Right? This is the Mindful Leader, Mindful Leadership podcast, right? So the first question I'm asking of any leader is, do you need to walk your talk if you're a leader? What do you mm -hmm. think, Jim? Yeah. But if you ask the leader, tell me the conscious talk you're trying to walk each day. Usually, if you if you listen to this, you go blank. It's like we don't even know what that talk is. Yeah, yeah. So this is the weird part of human beings. Yeah, leaders need to walk their talk. Okay, well, what's your talk? And then people go blank. It's like, well, a moment ago you were judging other people for not walking the talk, but you don't even know your own talk. Yeah, and it's this consciousness that's about mindful leadership. It's this, it's this deliberate consciousness. Yeah, what do I stand for? Why does it matter to me? Can I communicate it? And can I ask people to hold me hold me to account? on that so even as a parent and i'm just using today's example it varies each day but let's say marriage and parenting for yeah. kids you know like if i say to my kids I, i'm committed to being kind to you and i say to my kids here's the behaviors i know that i do that are unkind and i want you please to tell me if i'm behaving in any way like that because i don't want to be an unkind parent yeah. that's an example of a conscious deliberate who am I and who do I want to be? Very few people in my experience even do that for planning. Then even less people do the practicing, yeah. right? And then the other thing is, if you give me feedback, am I going to defend and attack you for giving me feedback or am I going to welcome it and be grateful and adjust? All of that requires self-management. Yeah. And here's the interesting thing. We've asked... Uh, I don't know how many tens of thousands of leaders we've had the privilege of working with over the years, but a lot. And we've asked leaders over and over and over again, uh, uh, is self-awareness important for leadership? It's another one of our dumb questions. And they say, yeah, of course it is. Okay, well, what is it? What is self-awareness? That's a tough question to answer, by the way. Yeah. Most people would say, you, you know your impact on others? And we would say, no, that's 
other people's awareness of you. That's not your okay. self-awareness. And then the third, and you might know this because you've interviewed so many amazing people, but the third question we usually ask is, is if I had to ask you to be self-aware right now, as a practice, what would you actually do? Let's all be self-aware. Just pause the podcast for a second, everyone. Everyone listening, let's be self-aware right now. Okay, what, what are you doing to be self-aware? Absolutely. That's, that's a tough question to answer as well. I'm not going to answer it right now. I'll just leave it hanging there. But what's really? Oh, no, I was going to answer it for you, but I won't. Uh, I, okay, I, I don't know. Have a go. I, have a go. How would you? How would you? I, what I'd normally do is talk to myself. And I'd normally talk to myself how I want to be. And it's been knowing yourself, meaning knowing your own thoughts. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is we tell ourselves stories all the time. Yeah. How can we tell ourselves a better story about ourselves? Yeah. How can yeah. we actually understand ourselves in a more of a productive way that can generate good feelings about ourselves? So we yeah. recognize our own qualities, but we also recognize our own thoughts that we can work on and can internally behave and change. So okay. I think it's just being grounded and it's also no, knowing who you are, which is one of the most powerful things. Like I, I'm 50 now and it's taken me ages to find out who I am as a person, but it's yeah. taken a lot of internal work. Yeah. Am, am I going on the right lines here with how you would work? So there's, there's several elements, like, and I don't want to come across as fundamentalist in any way, but no, it, is, it is a little bit quite when I give you the answer, it is a little bit kind of obvious and there is a technically correct answer for yeah. it. And you you hit some key elements of it that were valid. Uh, and some I would, uh, if we had more time, I would be saying, hold on a second, how would you practice that? And you've, okay. you've also done some interesting things around knowing yourself and, uh, and, and redefining stories, interesting too, uh, which are not part of self-awareness, interesting. Knowing the stories is a part of self-awareness redefining the story not necessarily part of self-awareness that's more um that's a different practice yeah. so how to be self-aware right now now just before i give the answer just to give you a sense of how significant this is mm -hmm. you cannot sustainably change and systematically change behavior without self-awareness mm -hmm. you are going to keep repeating patterns that are destructive for you without self-awareness Mm -hmm. The first, the first gate to get to self-awareness is full accountability. So we, mm -hmm. you ask these really dumb, simple questions. If you're stuck in a, um, no, we use. I'll give you the question. Uh, you know, what causes stress in your life? Now, most people would say, oh, my wife, my husband, my dog, my cat, my job, COVID, whatever it is, right? Yeah, causes yeah. Stress in my life. But what they'll do is they'll name all these factors externally to themselves. And we know from the research that most of our stress is caused by this thing here, this mind, 90% mm -hmm. of it at least. Very few people would say, yeah, I caused my, all, all my own stress. I, start, I believe that my stress and suffering come from everything outside of me. And because I believe that, I'm obsessed with changing and improving everything outside around me in the pursuit of happiness and freedom mm -hmm. from stress. Mistake, big mistake. Yep. Because it's not an accountability process right so first thing we need people to get is that the source of your dysfunctional behavior the source of your suffering the source of your bad decisions in your life and so on and so on is you mm -hmm. now without blame because compassion and, and and growth come together not blame blame does not create growth mm -hmm. um the second question is okay so now that i can take full accountability for it great but now i need to manage myself better so if I say to my wife, you know, hey, I do raise my voice sometimes. I accept that. I get it. I don't go, but you I only do it because you, you, that's the blame story. That's not accountable. And I, then I say, okay, um, I do do that behavior. And sometimes it's challenging for me not to raise my voice when see things, but it doesn't matter. I, okay. I'm, I'm not aware enough. I don't want to raise my voice. I don't want a difficult relationship. I want to be calm and clear under all kinds of pressure. Okay. And I take full accountability for it. No excuses. Mm -hmm. Perfect relationship is where your partner can also take that level of accountability for their behavior. Perfect team, perfect organization is when everybody can go, this is my part of the challenges around here. This is what mm -hmm. I'm working on in myself to grow. And everyone else is doing the same. We have a chapter in the Mindful Leader called 200% Accountability. And that's the principle. Because if one person takes accountability and other people don't, it turns into, it doesn't, doesn't work out well. That's right. That doesn't work. You, you, 
look, you still take accountability. And if the other person doesn't, my recommendation is walk away from that relationship. But a great healthy relationship is mutual accountability. If you are struggling with a teammate or a, anyone and you, and you both have the willingness to sit down and go, what am I doing that's creating the challenge here? And the other one's doing the same instead of the, the finger pointing. They are a radically different conversation. One creates healing, connection, growth, and understanding. The other creates blame, numbness, deadening, and yep. bad relationships. So now I've got the accountability part right. How do I do the self-awareness part? Because so what if I, I don't want to shout anymore, but I keep doing it, right? I need enough ability what, to what we call to regulate my behavior. Mm -hmm. Self-awareness that allows me self-regulation. In other words, I can regulate that impulse to shout and stop it. So mm -hmm. how do I do that? And in really simple terms, uh, if you understand the four foundations of mindfulness, mindful leadership, the four foundations of mindfulness are the most comprehensive teaching on mindfulness. Like they're basically the ultimate technical manual on how to do mindfulness. And interestingly enough, they also answer the question on how to do self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So first foundation of mindfulness is mindfulness of the body. Yep. Can, you know, if your listeners are listening here, can I, can you be mindful of your body right now? In other words, can you notice what's going on in you physically? Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed when you really notice your body that anger, for example, has a different sensation in the body than joy, than calmness? If you know through feeling into the body what's going on in the body, you can make some wise choices. So, for example, you're about to shout. There's a good chance if you're awake and aware of the body, you'll feel the tightness and heat in the body before yeah. the voice comes out. So the ability to feel it and know it and then know how to intelligently breathe with and work with difficult feelings allows you the possibility of not going down the route of past habitual <laughs> behavior. So first part of awareness is I'm a, I can be aware of the body. We also talk about values work, for example. We talk a lot about ethics and values in our program, a lot. Big emphasis. When you are being honest, for example, does that have a different signature in your body than when you're being dishonest? Mm -hmm. If you spend a day being deceitful and dishonest versus a day being really honest, is that does the body feel different at the end of those days, each yeah. day? And when there's a saying we have, the body never lies, the mind lies all day long, a lot. Does. Funny stories and rationalizations. So the body can be trusted as a truth mechanism. The body, you know, when I need to go to sleep, the body's telling me. When I need to stop eating, the body's telling me. When I, I'm in congruence in my life, the body's telling me. When I'm doing, when I'm taking on behaviors and habits that don't serve my life, my body's telling me. But most of us have completely forgotten to listen to the body. And when we explain this to, we have a lot of very sophisticated, intelligent clients, like in pharmaceuticals and finances and mm -hmm. consulting and you name it. We've got, you know, uh, engineers and so on. They, it was almost disappointing. It's like, I thought you guys were like sophisticated. And you telling me to listen to my body? Yep, <laughs> pretty much. That's the first practice of mindfulness. If you are not listening to your body, you are listening to your BS and your mind. Yep. And that's not a good idea. And this lies and this tells the truth. The second element I can be aware of right now is a wing. I can be aware of the, the narrative in my mind, exactly as you said. And there's ranges of subtleties in there. Yep. I can be aware of the narrative. I can be aware of the attitude behind the narrative. I can be aware of my attitude towards you. I can be aware of intent. Mm -hmm. that, that requires a very refined level of mindfulness to know that. Um, I can even notice the assumptions underneath my narrative. That's very deep work, but I can notice that now if I've got enough awareness. Mm -hmm. I can, and that's the third foundation of mindfulness. I'm just skipping up to the third. The second foundation of mindfulness is I can notice my reaction to my physical or mental experience. Mm -hmm. so I can notice I, I have resistance to this feeling. For example, uh, I'm about to go and have an honest conversation that I need to have. I'm feeling terrified and fearful and resistant. I notice the push and aversion to the fear. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? In noticing that whatever I notice, I have choice over. Whatever I don't notice chooses, chooses my behavior. Bottom line. To, to be able to be choiceful around behavior and not be habitually driven requires awareness. Mm -hmm. And then the last part I can notice, which is the fourth foundation of mindfulness, which is, is a function of the first three. So awareness of body, awareness of 
all things emotional in mind and then awareness of my reaction to those mm -hmm. which is really live uh once i've got that right i can begin to notice the dots and patterns in my life i can be noticed for example i i might notice that i'm feeling anxious body's tight uh, i notice the narrative in my mind is oh i'm thinking about work again mm -hmm. i notice fear and resistance in the body and the next thing you know i'm walking up to the fridge to grab a beer and so i start connecting actions to feelings and seeing my patterns in my life that serve me and don't serve me mm -hmm. that is all the skilled practice of self-awareness and it's not particularly you know most of our clients we ask did, did anyone teach you self-awareness training to manage your own mind manage your own your own emotional world through your phd your degrees they all unanimously say no did you learn it at school no he's like well do you think that might have been an important part of your education missed because you could be really successful going through and, and have terrible personal relationships because no one taught you yeah. we had a client just yesterday um very senior leaders uh like very very senior leaders and there's a group of eight of them and they're about to go through one of our digital programs and we said and i said did anyone ever teach you these skills they were all a wonderful group they're all like no actually not so I said, would it make sense that as we go into this journey, you're like complete beginners and you're incompetent at this and, and it comes with all of its vulnerabilities and difficulties. And they were laughing and they said, yeah. I said, cool. So we can make lots of mistakes and learn as we go. It's messy. Great. Because the interesting thing about self-judgment, which is one of those narratives, mm -hmm. and a lot of us judge ourselves. So if you're listening to this, there's a good chance you've got three favorite words, should, must, and need. I should be more like this. I must go and do more exercise. I need to lose weight. I need to uh, da, 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 da. Should, must, and need is all language of inner judgment, the inner yeah. critic. Yeah. Most of us have got a huge inner critic. Most of us believe that our, our inner critic serves us, keeps us on the straight and narrow, teaches us lessons, helps us grow. It's like our inner parent in a way. What's fascinating is that firstly, that's wrong. It doesn't. Uh, uh, it doesn't. It also... Uh, is there because we have a profound distrust of our own being mm -hmm. of who we are but interestingly enough it's completely devoid of curiosity so when you're judging yourself you'll notice there's zero curiosity none in it at all and then you ask the question can you learn without curiosity no no so there's no curiosity in judgment so how am i learning i'm not really learning i'm just traumatizing myself and shaming myself mm -hmm. and then it's kind of in tongue in cheek say which one are you the judge or the one being judged or you're just schizophrenic in the mind because the mind plays these weird games all the time. So growth and self-awareness is challenging, but it also has to be held with uh, compassion and curiosity. And it's also uh, to do with the how um, the subconscious mind because change cannot happen in the conscious mind uh, because that's the self-doubt, that's the inner critic, that's the, uh, the sabotage, and that's the, the one that makes you make wrong decisions. But when you talk from the inside out, uh, uh, it makes a difference. And that's the only way that I've been taught is to make change and make change actually happen. That's why uh, visualization uh, techniques is hugely powerful. And something that I use all the time is uh, visualizing using the central information, uh, your, your smell, your touch, um, your feelings, uh, and so on and so forth. We all know the, the senses. Uh, apparently, there's a sixth sense, which is uh, apparently the third eye. But uh, I also believe that there's a direct correlation between that as well and the connectivity between people. And I love that. And I love the curiosity. I think the golden nuggets that you've given is phenomenal. question that I was thinking of is how can you change from a fixed mindset to an open mindset? How, how, how does that shift actually happen? And I have, I'm sure you've seen it plenty of times. Yeah, so we, we there's a fascinating aspect and there's a million ways to answer this question. So I'm going to give you one of many potential yeah. answers. Yeah. Right? The fascinating thing is that fixed mindset is based on fear, firstly. And it's also based on ignoring reality because reality yeah. is anything but fixed. It's constantly fluid. And the mind gets really scared of that fluidity. In, in, in deep mindfulness practice, we one of the most, if not the biggest challenge of all, as all human beings, is to come to terms with impermanence. Yeah. yeah. Come to terms with the fact that everything you love will slip away. Everything that you own will slip away. 
Uh, yeah. Everything changes. It's impossible to hold on to anything. It will slip away. There's nothing holdable, ontable. And we don't like that. So what we do is we create a fixed mindset and the fixed mindset gives us the illusion of stability and security. It's not real. It's a fantasy, but it gives us a psychologically psychological illusion of stability. And then it's like, don't mess with my illusion because it's helping me feel secure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And for a lot of people, they don't have a, another mechanism to feel secure. How do you feel secure and embrace change? That's yeah. hard to do. Yeah. Mindfulness yeah. practice gives you all the pr practices for that because you ground yourself in the fluidity of reality instead of fighting it and freaking out about it. But here's the interesting thing, and I've picked up a little... Um, my, my I, little I, 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 I was trying to work out what that was. For, so thought, maybe for the audio listeners, if they uh, can describe what you have in your hand. I'm holding a little mini tripod, right? Just, it's just an object, any object, right? My little daughter loves to come to my screen here and hold this tripod, my one-year-old. So um, if I'm holding this tripod, just imagine this represents fixed mindset, okay? And you t and I believe I'm. this is valuable, this fixed mindset. I might not even believe it. It just makes me feel secure, right? And you tell me you need to let that go. It's like, try as I might, I don't know, like, how am I going to let that go? You know, because I, well, I'm now in a dilemma. We often say with transformational work, it's like most people don't want to really go from a butterfly, sorry, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's a dramatic transformation. Mm -hmm. Most people want to be a caterpillar with wings. And like, I'll take the sort of semi-transformation. So how do you really create reliable shift in mindset? What we do is we help you understand How's your hand feeling holding on to that mm. tripod? Is there any exhaustion or pain? Let's take a good look. Because I know at one level you think it's keeping you secure, but let's look at how it really feels holding this. Yeah. Fixed mindset, but you really feel into it. it. It's painful and full of fear. As long as, and then if, there, if I can get you to see through curiosity and compassion, that this thing I'm holding on to is actually exhausting me and hurting me, then it, I don't need to try and let it go anymore. Mm -hmm. But I see that it's not helping me. It's natural to let go. And I think when we try and force people to Love change it. things, it doesn't work. What they've got to, we help them see, it's kind of like, how's that, like Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, yeah, every night, I, every night I came and I shout at my kids, you know, and they should be more well behaved. Like, how's that shouting working for you? That's yeah, a yeah. simple question of just beginning to look more closely at our lives with courage, because it does take courage, and honesty. Absolutely. And then naturally what begins to happen is transformation. Because mm -hmm. we see, but the whole, you know, it's like saying to someone, don't be afraid. It's a ridiculous statement to say to someone, or just drop that. Just let that go. It's like, yeah. really? Did you just tell? Like, that's kind of amateur psychology at its worst, right? You can't just let something go. You have to look at it and see mm -hmm. what it's giving you, see its potential fears, maybe your assumptions, what will happen. Bad things will happen if I let go of this little tripod, you know? Okay, let's look at what these bad things will happen. Let me uncover my assumptions mm -hmm. and fears that I've been believing. You know, a lot of people struggle with, for example, they, they approval from others. They, they feel they really need approval. And that comes in two forms usually. I need to impress everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to be impressive. Did you know I've written a book and I'm a bestseller? I'm impressive, aren't I? That's one form of begging for approval. Yep. And then the other form is, is usually being nice and likable. I'm not one of those arrogant people. I'm a nice person and I'm really nice and pleasing. Mm -hmm. And I can start, start to see that those, those qualities, when I, so, so what I'll t tend to do with clients sometimes is if they're in, in the middle of a plea, trying to please, I'll go, stop right there. Describe what's going on in your body. Describe the feelings that come with it. How does that feel for you? How's that? And as they feel into it, they go like, this doesn't feel fun at all. It's just a feeling coming, coming from a needy, pleasing place in my body. It yeah. does not feel good at all. Okay, good. What do you think is going to happen if you don't please that person? And it's like, oh, they're going to reject me. And, and then what's going to happen? And you start uncovering these assumptions. To me, mindfulness practice itself 
is really fascinating. The vast majority of people understand mindfulness as a kind of calming Zen thing. You know, it's like mental health calming. We don't mm-hmm. teach. It. That's a very important part of it, but there's a whole lot more. That's like kind of like first gear of the Ferrari. There's like another six gears. Mindfulness to me, its primary purpose is growth. Yep, I agree. And the ability to see what's going on accurately with honesty, to be curious enough and have a steady enough mind to stay in the burn. Because sometimes when you look at things, it's super painful. But can you stay and keep looking instead of backing away into numbing behaviors? Mm -hmm. And then in the seeing of that and the staying with that is the possibility for new change, for dropping that behavior, or for having the honest conversation I've been running away from. So we do a lot of work with distress intolerance, what we call distress intolerance. You could almost root every single negative behavior in our lives, destructive behavior in our lives, to an unwillingness or fear of sitting with an uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. But if we learn to sit with uncomfortable feelings, we no longer are driven into dysfunctional behavior. There's an interesting connection. There's a massive element of trust and trust in the process will work because you got to self-talk to yourself to make sure that it does work and check ecologically that it, it sits with you uh, in your beliefs and your own strategies. But uh, I, I love the way that you've given that. That's really well presented. I, I think uh, I love feeding forward and giving some wonderful golden nuggets to people so they can help and learn from what they've done. And I think that's wonderful what you've uh, said today. I think that's incredible. I just want to add one other important thing is that and you talked about it like short is the idea of short term, long term. So in some of our programs, so you, just so our app is very built off developmental mindfulness. We we less interested in the general big apps out there. They're mostly centered on calm and yep. zen. And, you know, it's understanding the mind, but it's very ours is much more centered around how do you grow as a human being and grow and really understand the growth process. Yep. Now, what's really interesting is that. There's adult development research tells us that the more mature you are, the longer term centric you are. It's such a paradox. Mm -hmm. So the more mature you are, the more present you are and aware in the present, but you consider your actions much more from a long term perspective. And if you permit me for a moment to quote the Buddha, given Mm -hmm. that we're talking about mindfulness, the Buddha was once asked, and for those of people who don't know Buddhism, even though Asia has uh, its very re- religion, the way I've certainly been introduced to import Buddhism, there's no belief structures whatsoever. It's as pure a psychology as you can get. There's just no belief in it. It's it's all about working with the mind and how do you intelligently work with your mind and how do you alleviate suffering, which is the question psychology wants to answer, which is the same question for mm-hmm. Buddhist practice. But the Buddha was asked, how did you fully let go of all suffering? How did you fully awaken to a suffering-free mind? One of his wonderful answers was, well, every moment of my life, I considered if I cultivate this thinking, this behavior, over time, will it lead to freedom and joy or will it lead to imprisonment and suffering in my mind? And Mm -hmm. the consideration of a long... Now, if we come, if we forward one, two and a half thousand years into the latest stuff around cognitive behavioral therapy, It's asking the same question. It's taken two and a half thousand years to catch up, but it's good. It's caught up. And it's starting to ask the same question. If I cultivate this behavior now, over time and repeatedly, where does it get me? And this is an interesting question for uh, all of us to ask. For example, if you learn to meditate uh, for 10 minutes a day and you came home after a rough day of work, for most of us, we don't come home after. It's it's like you walk out your door into the house. After a rough day of work, he's still in the same house. And what's what's more appealing, right? A beer in front of the telly or going to sit in silence and meditate and you'll be feeling the pain in your body and the tension and stress in those 10 minutes more acutely because you're meditating. Which one's more appealing? And it's like, I don't know any human being who would say, oh, give me the meditation. And it's like, no way. Netflix, <laughs> give me Netflix. <laughs> Give me Netflix, give me that beer, that wine. I'm yeah, dying. yeah, go grab it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's very understandable for us to want this, right? The question, the wisdom question or the mindful question is, okay, great. 
maybe I'll do that occasionally. But which of those two habits do I want to cultivate mm -hmm. for my long-term happiness and well-being? Because most anxiety, depression, and so on is the accumulation of a lot of bad habits it is, that yeah. we are addicted to and numb. So you've, you, you, you mentioned it earlier, and that's exactly what we ask in culture change with clients. We go, let's look at your behaviors that bring you short-term rewards that actually create long-term pain in the culture. An example would be avoiding the honest conversation with people. Yeah, of mm -hmm. course you do. I, I totally get it. Who wants to go and have a confronting conversation with their boss, their colleague? That's uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. Good. Now, if you don't practice that and you, cult you cultivate avoidance and you forward one a year from now, where's your team health look like? Where's your levels of trust look like? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes obvious for people. Ah, I get it. So even though going to have that conversation now is painful and appears to be a bad idea because it's painful, I learned to tolerate short-term pain, still follow the values, because I now understand my behaviors in a bigger context, that I want to work in a team where there's high levels of trust, because guess what? You can't have strong innovation, for example, in a team that doesn't have trust. It's hard because it's vulnerable to try to innovate. And if you don't have trust, now you so you start answering those bigger questions for yourself. And I think that's for all of us, is to ask that simple question. I was going to uh, add on to that because I, I meditate. Uh, I, I don't practice it every day. Uh, I practice in the days, normally Monday to Friday. Outside of that, my meditation is to run into the mountains. I go into a complete trance and I start to think and start to think in sort of rational ways, maybe because the serotonin is kicking in and the uh, the body's, body's in sort of... Uh, that place and I'm out in the open spaces, but I find my mind is in a meditative state at that particular time because I can start to think rational thoughts because uh, the heart is pounding and everything else. It's just a different take on it, but I find I go into trance that way. And even when I cycle, I go into a trance, but I go into an internal trance where I can do self discovery and also find out some ideas that I've never thought of before. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, we would say there's moments of presence and then the mind is still relatively balanced. Now, given I'm such a purist, though, forgive me, I'm such a purist on mindfulness itself. Mm -hmm. uh, mindfulness itself is utterly disinterested in our thinking. Yep. Utterly. When we're practicing mindfulness, we are disinterested. We're not, we're, we're not disinterested in our thinking per se. It's like, I don't I mean to try and explain this accurately. We're most interested in what the promise of our thinking is. Are we still buying into BS? Oh, I, I've got this great thought of a new business idea. Oh, uh, great. Okay. What's my mind? Oh, if you get that business idea, you'll make more money. If you make more money, you'll be happier. Oh, wow. Look at that. I'm yeah. now buying into delusion again. So mm -hmm. when I'm practicing mindfulness, I'm not interested in getting new thoughts. I'm just interested in examining which, by the way, for, for people who are new to meditation, it's a very advanced meditation practice. For most of us, you just need to stabilize the mind with your breathing and your body. But if, you're, if you have the ability to see your thoughts without trying to control them or get new thoughts, it allows you to begin to understand your own mind. And mm -hmm. it also allows you to begin to understand your deepest beliefs. And then it allows you to question those beliefs. I've got a really easy example. I'm meditating one day, lots of tension and charge in my body. Right. And I noticed first foundation, poof, there's a lot of suffering in my body, it's tension and discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. My busy with my to-do list. It's like you've got this and this and this, this, this to do. So, so then I'm like, but you're supposed to be meditating. Like, oh, I'm now this all happens like this, right? That my mind is believing that when the to-do list is done, then I'll be at peace. It's like, aha, okay, that's what my mind's believing, which is not creating tension in the body, suffering. And I believe the end of the suffering will come at the end of the to-do list. When does the to-do list end? Uh, when you die okay mm -hmm. that's interesting so you never if you're alive if anyone listening to this you've got a to-do list guaranteed right so if you believe that your your true peace will come at the end of a to-do list and if that's subconsciously there all the time well guess what you're going to suffer un unnecessarily for the rest of your life with that belief mm -hmm. and you can evidence that you can see that in practice it's like wow I'm suffering in the body right now on the belief that to-do lists need to get done on the viewpoint. And this all reveals itself quickly. And then the to-do list just disappears because then we can rationally look at it and go, 
Well, what's the best way to get through a to-do list? Being present and aware and balanced. Good. Let me practice being present and aware and balanced now and to hell with a to-do list. Yeah. Because, and so I think when we practice mindfulness insight, what we call insight-based or developmental mindfulness, yeah. it's completely without agenda. I'm not looking to get any particular kind of thinking. I'm just purely interested in what's going on and mm -hmm. be able to see what's really going on. And most of the time, it's crazy. <laughs> Final question for you. Um, if I gave you a magic pill, this magic pill converts you uh, and gives you a superpower, but only for five minutes. What would you use it for and how would you use it? And what superpower would it be? God, that's a hard question to answer because there's the natural one around, around wanting the end of the world suffering, right? It's like it's the natural desire to, um, I mean, honestly, I don't know how I could do it for five minutes, but if you could awaken the world, awaken the human race to its own suffering and, 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 and the human race to become a lot more tender and connected and open, um, that's what I would wish for because uh, our, our environment needs it. Uh, sorry, I'm getting emotional here. There are environment needs it. Um, our children, the thousands of countless of abused children need it. Mm -hmm. um, our, our species that are going extinct need it. Yeah. Uh, nations, are, you know, there's just so, it's just too much abuse yeah. and there's too right. much pain in this world. And, and, I, and I think it's possible because we're not sensitized. We're disconnected from ourselves. And if mm -hmm. we could all really connect deeply uh, with ourselves and others, then the world would be a much, much more loving, healthy place. That's oh, what that's, I would say. That's a beautiful answer. I really like that. Uh, and you're not the first person to say that. There's so, someone else uh, in Ireland that I interviewed a while back uh, said similar lines, but it's hugely powerful. It's very... Uh, normally, most people think I want to fly. Well, we all want to fly, but uh, yeah, that's a completely selfish one. And you go, yeah, I want to fly for five minutes. I want to do that. So, uh, yeah. but a very unselfish uh, 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 way of thinking of it. I love that. How can people find out uh, more about you? So LinkedIn is a great place to connect with me uh, on, on uh, Michael Bunting on LinkedIn. Uh, we've got a, we've got an app, Awakened Mind, which is very appropriate for what we're talking about, Awakening the Mind, Awakened Mind. You can grab that off the App Store, and that's free. Uh, there's a free part of it, and then there's a premium part of it. It's so expensive. For people who don't know, if you've ever built an app, it's outrageously expensive to it build. Is. Yes. And to maintain them, it's insane. So the, the price point is just mostly survival-based um, pricing. And, uh, and then Mindful Leader... Uh, .net is a current website. When people are listening to this, it might have transitioned to, it says mindfulleader.net. It might change to the mindfulleader.com. Yeah, there it is there. Uh, but that's going to transition onto the mindfulleader.com and they can check out all the different things. We've got a ton of interesting development programs in the app as well. So if you've listening to this and you go, God, I'd really like to teach myself the process of self-awareness and mindfulness. Well, we've got a program for that in the app mm -hmm. with animated videos and so on. I'd like to understand that short-term, long-term brain thinking and how to structure a more healthy life. We've got a program for that. We've even got down with its corporate clients. We've got a whole four and a half month detailed leadership program uh, in there because we, we don't see mindful leadership as mindfulness for leaders. My first book I wrote was with the world's most researched leadership authors, Jim Cousins and Barry Posner. We mm -hmm. think of mindful leadership as an integrated conscious method to, to practice leadership properly, not just mindfulness, leadership. So to be values-based, to be empowering, to be uh, innovative and handle complexity, have a vision. All of those classic things that leaders need to do well, organizationally, we do in depth, but we add a deeper awareness and the ability to make them reliably practiced over time. And that's what the mindful leader, that book, I kind of joke, whenever I hold this up, I always say self-conscious, you know. <laughs> Like we talking, the camera. Yeah, talking about approval, right? You talk about approval being approval centric. Look at Absolutely. me. I'm an author. I'm important. It's like it's all the ego just trying to but go. You're, like, all, you're all for three books. So that makes you yeah, even yeah. more triply uh, more important. Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's just, it's a funny thing. You know, you write the books from love and you want people to read them, but it's hard to get the vanity of the ego out of all of it.
but you know uh, what you are doing is you're projecting your knowledge so people can help and learn and grow and if you do that via book that's wonderful if you do it by the uh, the app you do it by the website whichever way works and yeah. you're giving someone a gift so that's the way i like to look at it so michael it's been an absolute pleasure i've really enjoyed this interview today uh of the mindful leadership podcast and i hope that people listening to this will take added value back into their lives and listen more to themselves and really start to intently understand themselves, whether it's through meditation, whether it's through mindfulness or belief in yourself that you can change for the better. And I think it's always positive intention. So thank you again, Michael. Jason, it's been an absolute joy to be in here. Thanks for listening to me going on for so long. <laughs> No, that absolute pleasure is all mine because I loved it. I loved every single moment of it. So thank you once again. Thanks, everyone who listened.